Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and do you know what, I still have not got over the novelty of being able to do this. Bit of choke. This is a cold start. Wow, amazing. And I can actually now just roll the car backwards on its own power instead of having to tow it on the Freelander or push it. Oh, that is so good. Neutral, handbrake on. And just listen to this thing purr. Now, the object of today is to look at that wing, inner wing. In the last video, we uh, had a bit of a blast over this one, ground it back, rust killed, and painted some uh, stone chip on there. Today, we're going to do the same for this one. We've got a lot worse uh, flakiness doing its flaky business. So we'll get that sorted out and we've got some definite problem area just here. We'll take this pug off and find out what's lurking in there. And then we can put the wings on. Then we really are very much in the absolute end stages of getting this thing ready for its MOT, which is very exciting indeed. Okay, so I figured I'd start with what is clearly going to be the worst part of this whole little area here, which has got some old filler of some kind in here. So let's take a look at this and see what's lurking underneath. Might need to take this uh, cover sill off to get it sorted out, but we'll find out. Yet another P6 quirk. This thing that you can see here is only a cover sill. It's not a structural thing at all. It's just for decoration. It's only held on with a bunch of Phillips screws. So behind this, people buy a new to them P6 thinking they've got a lovely shiny car. So don't pull this off at the dealership or wherever they're buying it and discover they've got no sills underneath. This has had new sills down both sides uh, many years ago. So I'm hoping it's still solid because it was not completely gone when I got the car. You can see the colour it was when I bought it as well. Corsica blue. Now I know I say this every single time, but all the tools I'm using with Draper stuff and everything, it's all available on the Amazon affiliate link store. If you happen to click on that, even if you don't buy anything from my store, we're then going to buy a printer paper or chainsaw or something, um, I still get a tiny kickback from that as an affiliate link and it does go a long way to helping run this channel and pay for these cars. If you are buying anything on Amazon today, please do have a click of that little link down below. Ugh, cobwebs, but solid. Yeah, that's what you want your P6 sill to look like, not tragedy and full of holes. So this actually looks like a previous repair that was either not done and pugged over or done and then pugged over and not painted for some reason. There's a little hole there. There's a bigger hole just there with a, bit of part of a big lump of pug that I can't get out. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just gonna have to try and cut that little corner out. Cut a little square. I think it's a very rusty bit that I need to cut out as well. Oh, it's not as bad as I expected, but it's still slightly awkward. This bit here and this bit here, you can't get stuff in there to work it. So I'm really, really hoping that all I'm going to find under here is just this kind of surface rust and I can rust treat it and paint it, stone chip it black and then I'll be good. It's just this little patch here to weld, fingers crossed. Incidentally, if you love this project as much as I do, I know from the viewing figures of the last video, a lot of people do like this car. Don't forget we've got these amazing black Rover V8 uh, mugs with the Fuest Driving logo on one side and the Rover itself on the other. And we've also got the same image by Russell uh, Wallace, the automotive artist, on fridge magnets and little stickers as well, as well as all the Furious Driving ones. If you're coming to Rustable, you need a Furious Driving sticker in your windscreen. FuriousDriving.co.uk. Right, let's do some work. Battery down. So having 
taken as much of as I can on this, this inner wing. Apart from this little annoying patch down here, the only other hole I've got is this little area up here, which is virtually impossible to get a tool into, it turns out. But I'll soak some rust killer into here and see if I can tidy this edge up a bit, maybe put some weld in there. Right, so we've cut out this nice little neat hole on this side, but you can see through there, there is a bit of air showing through at the back, which isn't that bad. It's basically just a little hole in the floorboard, just there, so we'll patch up both sides and that side, then we can put the wing back on. Okay, this has been one of those escalating situations which I did not want to escalate today. This is not what I wanted to be doing. Right, okay, so I've cut this nice little kind of triangular weird shape underneath here, uh, which is gonna take a bit of filling. However, I don't know if you can see it through there, but I can see daylight through there. And when I push my finger into it, I can feel squishiness. The only place you're gonna find squishiness in this area is the back of this carpet because I've got a blooming great hole in the floor, which means I've got a bigger job on my hands than I had anticipated. So I've got a blooming great hole circling the floor. So I need to be cleaning up a whole bunch of this horrible stuff, which is a nightmare to clean off, back enough to clean that bit of hole. Great. Right, well, I've cleaned this up pretty well around this area, so there's not too much stuff to catch fire. Made a weird bit of shape metal to go and fill that hole up, and hopefully we've now got no hole in the floor. Okie dokie, quick sit rep, it's now half past four. That hole in the floor is now buttoned up. Um, it looks almost like there's a dent from the outside into this footwell. I might get a mallet and a big block of wood and just put that down a wee bit before I do too much else. Um, filled in the little triangle shape on that corner by the jacking point. FYI, never use the jacking point in a P6. And just do this big shape here, just to be quickly zipped over and sorted out. Right, the only thing left to do now is to mask up, get some gloves, and stone chip this before the wing goes back on. And then, butter bing, this is gonna look like a car again. That will be in the morning though. Okay, extra job, I need to clean the exhaust downpipe and the side of the engine because I've just wax oiled that as well. Other than that, all done. Okay, now the car is finally put back together and the welder is put away, so we can get on with what I thought we were gonna be doing straight away in this video, which is fitting the wings, and I can show you the insanely brilliant construction method used by Rover P6s. They've got a strong base unit, and the outer panels are unstressed decorative items that just sit there to make the thing look pretty. The idea was that midway through the car's life cycle, they could redesign it and have a complete refresh on the car, without actually changing any of the underlying structure. Never happened, they never stopped selling faster than they could build them. But that means fitting the wing is literally a five minute job because there are two bolts here at the front, a little peg at the back, and then one bolt shared with the bonnet mounting, and you're on there. There's also an additional screw, which unusually on this one, actually hasn't rotted off. So uh, we can even fit that as well. Right, let's pop the bonnet and get some wings mounted. The first thing to do is of course to find the wiring for the indicator and a side light so we know where that is so in a minute we can feed it through. Incidentally the height of the bonnet in relation to the doors is fixed by shimming underneath the, the hinge over here so at this point we can adjust that as well so I've got my big box of washers out as well to make sure that fits. Now the easy bit really is easy pop off my protection because this has all been tucked away in the garage for a long time now so all we do is line up this little peg, or is it in there, with a little receiver down there. And that's the only tricky bit that we do, really. Hang it off there, and we're basically in. And you can basically take an entire P6 apart with a half inch socket and a crosshead screwdriver. So then you find yourself your half inch socket or half inch spanner, whichever's easier. 
look up inside here. Line up your holes and you're there. This is such an easy car to put together. This is a good bit. This is when the car finally starts to look like a car again. It's like a real thing, not just a project on the drive. This is actually a car. We can really see driving it again happening very soon. There we go. It's not too bad. Maybe go with going back a tiny bit further back, but then you run the risk of clipping there. So I'm happy with that. So yeah, just finished tightening up these and the wing is on. Right, we have a slight issue in that um, I've clipped the bonnet shut now and uh, because I've moved the position of the hinge, the catch no longer uncatches. So it's lucky I've not got the grill in there. There we go. Free. Well, we are now very much into the realms of the small niggly bits, fixing little tiny bits and bobs here and there to get the car perfect and ready for the road. Unfortunately, it does mean lots of things which take a long time off camera and only show a few moments on camera. So it's gonna take a little while and maybe a couple of episodes to get this all exactly where we want to be. So if you wanna see the conclusion of this lesson, please make sure you hit like and subscribe, maybe even the bell notification. Got the point to open again so I can get back to putting the car back together some more. I'll have to adjust that completely once I've uh, got the front end back together. It's a surprisingly tricky little screw to get to in here. <laughs> but we're in it there. This car uses an awful lot of these big chunky screws with big chunky washers all over the place. Right, now, wing number two. Line this up in again. Now this is the trick to getting this first bolt in here. If you can just hold the wing slightly away, you can look down and see what you're actually doing and get things lined up. Okay, trying to feed the wires through from the driver's side, a little bit tricky because the brake servo is in the way. But what you can do is feed a bit of stiff wire through from outside, tape them together and drag them back together. Well, that's better. It looks like a proper car again now. We've got both wings, valances screwed onto the front. Now we need to attach the valance to the wings themselves using, well, this is actually quite, uh, quite tight. These little brackets which sit in little notches between the wing and the valance. We well, did have two of them. One of them isn't around anymore and this one feels very, very uh, reluctant to undo too much. So I'll only be able to fit one in for the moment. It's one of the situations where I don't want to go and buy another one just yet because I know the moment I do, I will find the missing one. It's always annoying. Exactly Sod's Law every time. One of the few times it's not a half inch spanner. There we go, clamped in on that side. And panel gap's better than a Tesla. Just need to go and find one for this side, which is probably in the back seat somewhere or under a chair or something. Right, now we're going to play with these awful old bullet connector things and hook up side light and the indicator they've got three wires earth and the two positives shouldn't take too long probably might even work when it's done but not exactly holding out high hopes haha -ha, amazing one side actually working hyper flashing of course because i'm sure the one on the back isn't working probably oh no it is blimey who knew phew now i need to work out how to make the headlights work because the earths and these things are always terrible. Watch this. We got one dip beam and we got, oh, we got two main beams today. We didn't have that earlier. The earths are all gonna be weird. Need to sort that out. It's always these bundles of dodgy earths, always right in the front of the car, ready to get all the bad weather, all the corrosion. And this is why the headlights and these things always go weird. But I've just noticed how faded and cloudy these headlights have gone. So I need to get them apart I think it's on the inside actually. Ooh. Oh, that seems better already. Well, that is enormously cleaner. The question is, what on earth was inside there to make it go so horrible? Okay, while I'm doing this, I'll do a quick run through of some of the questions that I keep getting asked in the comments. Uh, incidentally, um, these mounting rings are a bit rusty on the, on the surface, so I'm putting some rust killer on there. I haven't got any paint on, suitable paint in the garage, so I'm gonna put it back together and pop it apart again at some point in the near future. And actually paint on there. I don't wanna be using an aerosol and getting spray paint in the wrong places. 
Anywho, yeah, questions and answers. Uh, have I upgraded the brakes? No, not yet, because the P6 has got notably amazing brakes in it. Uh, it's one of the areas I wasn't too concerned about when it came to upgrading this car's engine because the brakes are already fantastic. It might be nice to see some vented grooved hold type performance discs on the front. Um, certainly some fast row pads wouldn't be uh, a bad thing to stick on there. Uh, that's something I'll look at in the near future, but in the meantime, I don't think it's going to be a major issue. Uh, have I upgraded the suspension? No, it could do with, uh, I actually think, lowering it a little bit um, because, well, with the performance of the car, it would certainly improve the handling significantly. I think it would actually look a bit better as well. It is a hot rod after all. Why am I still running the SU carburetors? Um, and the answer to that is that's not the long-term plan, but I wanted to make sure the engine and everything actually worked before I chucked any more money at this project because, well, I, I didn't want it to be a variable that was, why isn't the car working? It's because the new inner manifold and carburetors aren't sorted or fuel injection system wasn't um, calibrated correctly. And I'm sort of debating whether to go and do like an aftermarket fuel injection thing or whether to go carb, but I think I'll probably go carb just because the sound is just so good with carburetors, although better economy and potentially a bit more power out of, out of fuel injection. So it's a maybe, it's a maybe. Uh, why have I still got the automatic gearbox in there? Same reason as the carburetors. Oh, don't run away VHT. Uh, because I wanted to make sure everything was working before um, we chucked another, another variable and expense into the mix. But yeah, the plan to manual swap this car is very high on my list. And finally, the rear axle. Uh, am I aware that's probably gonna explode? Yes, that is also a thing that's gonna need to be done uh, probably at the same time as doing the gearbox because I'll need to have a custom uh, prop shaft made up for that, more than likely. That doesn't look as clean as the other ones. Hmm. So I have no idea what that earth, this kind of powdery, residue stuff is, but it's not nice. Incidentally, these cars came with sealed beam units and I changed these over to um, these removable headlight bulb type headlamp units uh, years ago when I first got the car. Uh, one thing I haven't done to this car yet, which I have done to the 2000, is to have a relay for the headlight switch because the fuses are really vulnerable and quite weak and they do sort of melt and catch fire. So. Yeah, I do need to do that before I start driving the car at night at all, really. Now, a few people did suggest JB Weld for sorting out the radiator, and that seems like a very good idea. So I have lolloped a whole bunch of it in there, and maybe it will stay. Apparently it's heat proof, so it should be okay. We're now getting towards the conclusion. Got shiny, shiny headlights now, you can actually see out of them again. But I'm still waiting on this JB Weld to dry. I had to time this particularly badly, didn't I? Let's go and put the bumper back in and we've got more of a complete face left again. Right, that's not going anywhere. All good. Okay, so although this car was actually pretty clean when it arrived, having done all the cutting and grinding and stuff on the thing, it's kind of dirty now. And do you want a free life hack? Life hack! Wash your car in the piddling rain because it takes all the heavy lifting out for you. The rain rinses the car for you, so you haven't got to get the hose pipe out. You suds it down using uh, Simon Bright Max Foam Shampoo because I don't need the ceramic elements today. And then because it's still raining, it'll rinse it for you as well. And because the rainwater is softer than the kind of water that comes out the tap, it doesn't dry streaky, which is great as well. Yes, it is very cold today. The steam off the sponge, steam off my breath. Not a lovely day to be doing business outside. Five minutes later, the thing is looking a lot shinier than it was before, dust free, dirt free. I'll just let the rain give it five more minutes of rinsing off, and I'll take it back under the shelter, give it a dry, and I can machine polish the boot lid, which is not quite as bad as the bonnet, but pretty awful. The lads at Hawk did a great job of actually polishing the bonnet for me. I didn't know they were gonna do that. I really thought that bonnet was gonna be an absolute goner in terms of paint, but they, they did bring it back. So hopefully we can do the same thing to this, which looks great when it's shiny. Always be aware of a car advert where the car is wet. The paint is gonna be terrible underneath that. <laughs> Another life hack for you. Now, I realize it's not a vital part of getting the car back on the road, but I really don't want this horrible, scuzzy, etched paint being part of my newly complete car. So I'm gonna get the old paint saver, the one cut from Diamond Bright on this thing and make it good. And one thing I hadn't mentioned is that the great news about having the car back here is I can do 
Junk for the trunk again. If you've got any junk for a junk in the trunk, then do get it in the post, PO Box 477. All the rest of it's in the description below. Well, that is significantly shinier now. That has got a lovely gloss to it. It's kind of hard when it's this moist in the air to get a good good polish on it, but I've not even used the finish on it yet. It was like an old lace curtain etched into the paint, but now it looks really nice. Boot lid looks decent, decker panel looks good. Uh, incidentally, this not very well fitting window seal was shipped all the way from Australia because Scott's old auto rubber was the only place anywhere that sold these things for a long time. And even then you had to cut it to fit, it's not a great fit. Now, people were mentioning in the last video, you do know you're going to need reflectors for that car for the MOT. Yes, I am. They are currently in the boot. The guy who painted this car actually filled in the screw holes by mistake. Um, so I had them glued on and they came off because gluing doesn't work. Right, so this is how you mount up the reflectors to the back of a P6. You screw a couple of holes into the back of the wing. Then this slots over there and a couple of screws go in the bottom of that. Obviously with the reflector panel in there. Rustproof paint on the back of those screws so that they are now rust proofing into that and that is how you do it. I hadn't put something on here previously because A I don't want to screw into my lovely new black paint and B I was thinking maybe there was a discreet somewhere else I could hide a reflector on the back of here that looks a bit non-standard a bit hot roddy but I didn't find a good alternative yet so I've just done it. I have drilled a hole. Incidentally the weather continues to be absolutely vile but at least under here I'm relatively dry just blowing in a bit over the side but I'm fairly dry. Carport life for the win. That's the back end of the car buttoned up as far as I think we need to do. The lights are working. The reversing lights aren't working because I think we detached the wire from the gearbox and I need to get back underneath it at some point and reattach that. But that's not an MOT issue. It's just, just one of those things. The reflectors are on, bumpers are on, everything is good. Here at the front, I've just remembered I had to uh, reattach this decker panel here, this scuttle panel. Um, there's two little bolts here in the center. These are not, not the original right ones, but that's all I could find in the garage. And a little screw either end. That side is pointing up at the moment because I can't get around to that side of the car. As soon as I do, I will fix that. And also I just remembered I've got no wipers on the thing. I realized that shuffling it around in the rain yesterday. Um, also, <laughs> at least one of them has very much seen better days. That is uh, more see-through in places than I would like it to be. Um, so yeah. I'll fit the blade wipers on and we'll get some new blades for it as soon as possible. Next time I go down to Halfords or wherever, I'll go and grab some of them. These literally just push on, so that's getting easy. The only things left to do now are the horn and the washers are still non-functional. Don't know why. This bonnet catch doesn't work. Don't know why. And the headlight wiring. I need to pull all that apart. Oh, and the brake bleeding. Um, the brake bleeding is not going to be too tricky. Hang on. I did get this rather lovely new uh, Draper. Uh, it's not an illegal item for participating in drug use. It is a pressurizable uh, brake bleeder, it's one person brake bleeder. And I've got one of those horrific uh, one man easy bleed things, but they're terrible. They work off the air, spare tire pressure. And so they start off being so high pressure that they just blast fluid everywhere. And then they quickly get to so little pressure they don't do anything and they're just a waste of time. So I needed to get this. Unfortunately, I didn't realize it doesn't come with the different adapters. You need to buy that as a separate set. And this has not got the same size adapter in this box as on the car. So waiting for that to arrive, that'll be in the next video when that's turned up. Hopefully I can at least get the bonnet shut because then I can put the grill on. We are this, this close to getting this thing MOT'd. Because this is a 1973 car, there's lots of modern regulations in the MOT test which don't count on this car because there are things that just weren't valid and weren't a thing when the car was built. But of course we do want to make it so it's all complying with everything that it would have done at the time to get an MOT pass as it is and also make it as safe as possible on the road today. I know many people are gonna complain about these little pointy fun things down here on the number plate. I'll take them off for the MOT because people moan about that, I know. Now, because the P6 was one of the first cars to get uh, kind of recessed, partially hidden wiper blades, this is actually quite a tricky thing to put on without scratching the paint. It's literally just a push fit, though. There we go. Mm. I need to move the car, I think. Right, those two are now when the car has moved issues, and I'm not going to start the car right now because I want to carry on and do my main focus right now, which is making the bonnet open and close. So I'm going to tighten this off in A position, and then see if I can see where it's actually striking by having this paper over here and then hopefully by doing that I can work out which direction I need to move this catch so it will actually work. Okay so down this comes and I can see now where exactly 
that was striking because I was trying in the dark last night and I was really sort of going in blind, not knowing where it had, it had landed in comparison to... So that is now... It's too far forward and it's too far over to that side. So, to move it... I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. Let's try take number two. This is one of those jobs that it really is very much trial and error. Oh, it's already latching, it's not even shut properly. Third time lucky, we're getting very, very close indeed. I think we're hitting a tiny bit far back and just a tiny bit over towards the driver's side. So I just need to take it over a tiny bit more. Important note, don't shut the bonnet with your spanner inside it, otherwise you're in trouble. Please work. Oh, is that bashed? I think it is. Can I pull the thing? Not quite. Oh, for Pete's sake. Okay, 97th attempt. I've also been marking the actual catch itself with marker pen so I can see where I've moved it to and from if I have to unbolt it. Okay, so that's not latching. Oh, front to back, it looks like it's perfect. But it's just left to right, I think, is now an issue. Okay, I am stuck again. The bonnet is latched down, and the only way I can open it again is with the spanner. I was hoping to have got the grill and all this trim back on the front again as well. It's literally only six screws, but it does make the car look so complete. However, yeah, because I keep needing to open it with a spanner, I'm not putting it back on there. It's going to be hours more just faffing and fiddling and playing with that. Um, to get this latch to work properly. And currently, because the bonnet is latched down, I can't do the headlights, I can't do the washer, and I can't do the horn. So that'll all be in the next episode, along with bleeding the brakes and maybe getting off to an MOT. But I have still got the interior to put back together again. But overall, the car is now very, very complete. And you've seen in this video, it just starts on first turn of the key every time. And that is fantastic. Uh, so I'm really, really happy with the way this is going. This is just a minor irritation rather than a big setback. So we're getting there. We really are getting very, very close to having this car actually driving and on the road. People did ask in the previous video when I said it's over 50 years old, so don't need an MOT. To put it back onto the road, we do need to get an MOT because in order to get your MOT free status, I think you need to have an MOT in place, which then expires and carries on ad infinitum and also because it's had an engine change I do need an MOT to update the V5 because currently the V5 shows the old engine when I tried to send it off to the DVLA to tell them I changed the motor and given the new details they didn't want to accept it until I've done a fresh MOT and also some people said I wouldn't be able to go um, tax-free historic status uh, MOT free and all the rest of it because I'm changing the engine but no because this is the same family of engines it's a it's still a Buick derived Rover V8 just a different capacity it is a small enough change that within the point system of what constitutes major changes, this is actually a very minor change as far as the DV layer is concerned. So we will be able to go historic status with this thing, go tax free and all the rest of it, which is fantastic. I can drive this into London, into the ULES. I can't take my 1.6 litre um, Mini Cooper. I can't take my 1.3 litre Punto, but I can take my 4.6 litre Rover V8. So stick up your bum, calm. Anyway, right, that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is this car is coming together rather nicely. Thank you for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and uh, yeah, hit like and subscribe. See you again next time.